Welcome to the Infinite Jungle. On today's episode, I am going to be talking about all core developers consensus call number 139, the latest developer call, Ethereum developer call that has happened. I'll share quick updates on the high level, uh, the high level decisions that were made on the call and I promise for this this episode, this week's episode, I'll make it quick. And then I will talk about the decision to delay yet again the SSZ, um, the inclusion of the SSC related EIPs into the Pectra upgrade. We've talked about this on prior shows, but um, the the consensus is that developers are not in a position to add any more new EIPs into the Pectra upgrade, but I want to unpack a little bit about how developers came to that conclusion yet again on this week's call. And finally, I would like to share some very interesting data on Ethereum distribution and the geography of Ethereum nodes around the world that was shared by a team called ProBlab. ProBlab has been doing some work on various, on creating a crawler, creating a tool that uh, reaches out to all of the nodes in the Ethereum network and gathers data about how those, how, how those nodes are functioning. Um, so it gives some insight as to uh, one metrics, a few, a few different metrics uh, through which to measure the decentralization of the Ethereum network. So we'll talk about that. Um, that is what you can expect from today's Infinite Jungle episode. As always, before we begin, here is a quick show disclaimer. I need to remind you to please refer to the disclaimer linked in the podcast show notes and note that none of the information in this podcast constitutes investment advice, an offer, recommendation, or solicitation by Galaxy Digital or any of its affiliates to buy or sell any securities. I am going to be extremely quick today about doing the updates. I feel like for the last couple episodes, I've really been spending a lot of time summarizing what's been happening on these calls. And as fun as those summaries can be, um, I also think that there is perhaps more insights that can be shared on these shows as well. So for the full summary of the call, be sure to check the call notes uh, that's linked in the show notes of the episode. At a very high level, developers are still on Pectra DevNet 2. These are the test nets on which these Pectra EIPs are being are being tested and, and client teams are, are figuring out how to how the interactions of these EIPs work with one another. They're implementing all of the code changes that they've designed for the network. Um, they are still on Pectra, Pectra DevNet 2. They're debugging uh, quite a few issues uh, across different clients, execution layer clients and consensus layer clients. These are bugs related to a variety of EIPs, uh, working out a bunch of kinks when it comes to the upgrade. They haven't yet, of course, included some pretty big changes um, that has been that developers have agreed to include into Pectra, but haven't made it into a DevNet yet, like EOF, like PeerDAS, um, and another one related to uh, Ethereum's SSC transition, which we'll talk about in a bit. Quick update here is that still on Pectra 2, TBD on Pectra DevNet 3, um, the next, the launch of the next DevNet, the uh, only kind of the only kind of update which isn't really an update because we've known this, is that uh, the change in terms of specifications from DevNet 2 to DevNet 3 is going to be that um, the latest design of EIP 7702, these are the, uh, this, this is the new type of transaction that will allow um, Ethereum user controlled accounts to have more flexibility. This EIP, EIP 7702, the design was in flux for quite um, a long time for the last couple of months. Uh, but now developers um, have come to an agreement with other smart contract wallet developers, different stakeholders in the Ethereum community, and they're going to move forward with the uh, design of EIP 7702 as is. So the latest specifications for this EIP are going into the next DevNet, DevNet 3. And developers are considering implementing EOF in Pectra DevNet 4 and then thereafter, perhaps including PeerDAS and Pectra DevNet 5. This is all extremely tentative. Of course, I imagine that bugs discovered on either DevNet 3 or DevNet 4 or DevNet 5 is going to delay the inclusion of major changes. Um, in terms of the specifications. Uh, but that's the update on DevNets, um, which honestly is not really an update. 
still on Pectra DevNet 2, TBD on DevNet 3, still debugging on DevNet 2. Um, developers are now going to have a weekly testing call. So they already have breakout calls for Peerdas, breakout calls for EOF, so many breakout calls. They have these developer calls, these ACD calls that they do to talk about protocol changes to the to the Ethereum blockchain. And they will now, on Mondays, have a weekly testing call for Pectra, which will dive into the development of the DevNets, how the DevNets are doing, any discussions around timelines for launching new DevNets. This was uh, created because developers were saying how um, the communication around DevNet launches was poor, and there were some certain client teams that uh, weren't notified um, about when DevNet 2 was launching even. And so now developers moving forward are going to have these weekly testing calls. This is something that they had also in lead up to the Denkun upgrade. Um, so they're starting that back up. Basically, the status of PeerDAS is still the same. Developers con are continuing to discuss the idea of removing sampling from the initial implementation of PeerDAS. And um, developers are still continuing to debate how exactly to go about changing the blob gas limit, which is the change that would uh, be the most impactful for rollups uh, in light of ongoing development for the PeerDAS upgrade. Um, so not going to go into PeerDAS too much today because both of those topics are going to continue to be discussed quite a bit more. Um, there was a couple of, of research updates uh, related to validator consolidations and talking about um, Ethereum's networking layer, but these were all pretty minor, I think, questions and discussions that I don't think is really really worth spending the time to go into. Um, one of the things that I do want to spend the time going to, honestly, those were all the updates. And clearly, there wasn't that much from this call. <laughs> there wasn't that much that developers really moved the needle on on this week's call. But you can't have you know a monumental call every single week. Ideally, these these developer calls become less and less consequential over time as the Ethereum protocol requires less, um, requires less and less invasive changes and becomes more resilient as a technology um, for the next several dec decades, we hope. Moving on to some of the parts of the call that I want to highlight and talk about in a little bit more detail. The first one is related to EIP 7688. EIP 7688 introduces a forward compatible data structure that smart contract developers can utilize as Ethereum developers um, move forward with changes to the execution layer data serialization method. So as a little bit of background, the serialization method, the data serialization method that Ethereum uses on the consensus layer is different from the execution layer. And that does cause um, inefficiencies in the way that these two layers of Ethereum speak to one another. And developers are all in agreement that eventually Ethereum's execution layer should update its serialization method from RLP to SSC. Um, it will, again, introduce more efficiencies to the network and allow the Ethereum protocol to be, to be using more updated technology um, like SSC. And one of the, the discussions that developers have been having for quite a few months now is whether or not to introduce this forward compatible data structure into the execution layer um, so that these other, so that the, the changes or the introduction of new data into Ethereum, new data structures into Ethereum through the Pectra EIPs. Um, this is, we're talking about, I can't remember exactly which ones, but I think they have, they relate to deposit what, deposits and withdrawals on Ethereum, validator deposits and withdrawals. Um, these are changes that have already been included into the Pectra upgrade. These are code changes that um, will have to be updated yet again once Ethereum makes its full SSE transition. However, the idea of, of EIP 7688 um, is to change, um, is to introduce this forward compatible data structure so that all of those changes um, don't have to be changed again um, in, the, in a future upgrade. So in other words, the SSE transition is coming 
And there are certain data structures that will be introduced through the Pectra upgrade, through the forthcoming upgrade, um, that if developers implement this EIP, then they can ensure that those, those data structures are forward compatible. And when smart contract developers, particularly staking pools and restaking protocols, when they interact with these new data structures um, introduced by the Pectra upgrade, they can know that that's an area of their smart contract that they won't need to change again um, during a future upgrade because those structures are packaged in this forward compatible um, container. It's called the SSC container. Um, so that's EIP 7688. And developers have been, of course, waffling. I like to say that term. It's a little funny, but waffling on this decision to uh, include it into Pectra. And one of the things that I thought was really interesting is, of course, developers came to the same conclusion as they have in prior weeks, that they are hesitant about including including the new changes into the Pectra upgrade because the Pectra upgrade is already so big. Um, they came to that decision. But I want to break down how that decision, how that decision was made. Because I say it on this episode, um, like almost as if that was the decision that all developers on the call came to. But I really want to use this opportunity to highlight that on these calls, the decision is often made by one person and the rest of the people on the call simply stay quiet and don't... Um, it's almost like a decision made because nobody else disagreed or nobody else kind of spoke up even more um, to, to push back on the decision. So this the person who's championing the EIP, EIP 7688, his name, he's a Nimbus developer, a uh, developer for one of the Ethereum clients, um, Ethereum consensus layer clients, Nimbus. Uh, his name is Etan Kissling. And Etan uh, has brought up this topic many times, but he brought it up again. He shared some updates on the implementation work for EIP 7688. Um, and he asked, again, you know, developers, should we consider this for inclusion in Pectra? Um, in fact, should we include it for inclusion in a particular DevNet? In DevNet 3, I think he said. And of course, to that, there were developers that uh, responded saying that, oh, well, you know, DevNet 3 is probably too early. Your earliest it could go in is DevNet 5, et cetera, et cetera. There was discussion around the, the EIP, how to really get it in. Um, and the chair of the call uh, he's a Ethereum Foundation. He's a researcher at the Ethereum Foundation. His name is Alex Stokes, and he's been chairing these calls in place of the usual chair of these calls, who's another Ethereum Foundation researcher. His name's Danny Ryan. Um, he had taken a bit of a hiatus, a little bit of a vacation um, from the call, and I think from other responsibilities that he's had at the Ethereum Foundation. Um, he was a major player in in getting the merge upgrade, the transition to proof of stake through. Anyways. Stokes, Alex Stokes, he prefaced the conversation right after um, Etan shared, you know, this is what I'm looking for. And before, honestly, more uh, developers chimed into responding to what um, Etan was suggesting, um, Alex jumped in and prefaced the discussion on EIP 7688 with a bit of a warning to all the developers on the call. He was saying that the Pectra upgrade is already massive and that developers should be extremely wary about including more things into the upgrade. Um, and so with that kind of color, the conversation around whether to include EIP 7688 went, went forth. And there was, surprisingly, well, maybe not surprisingly, because I think the sentiment has been shared on prior calls before. But surprisingly, in the sense that it went against what Alex was warning developers about. You know, Alex had 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 kicked off, or right after Etan sh shared, and before the the discussion really really went into full swing. Like I said, Alex said, you know, be very careful, be very wary about deciding to do this, and. Shortly thereafter, representatives from nearly all of the consensus layer client teams did express their support for the EIP. Um, representatives from the Lodestar client, Prism, Teku, Lighthouse, they all shared some measure of support for EIP 7688. And the chair of the call, Alex, kind of reiterated his hesitation about including the EIP into the upgrade to the point where I think 
developers, despite expressing their interest in including EIP 7688, um, they also recognized that the person leading these calls was not was not keen on actually making the decision to include it into the upgrade. And so ultimately, Alex asked if it would be all right with developers on the call if the if the code change, the decision to include the code change was delayed. And to this, Etan shared that yes, of course, um, it's fine. You know, a decision doesn't have to be made currently because developers are still working through the Pectra EIPs, everything that they've already said they want to include into the upgrade, they haven't even included in the DevNet. Um, so they can revisit, developers can revisit this, this topic again. Um, but Etan's question was, well, when do we have to make a decision by? Because he's been bringing it up for several calls now and, you know, how long there's going to have to be a time when developers have to make this decision. So when should it be? And uh, developers didn't really have a, or Alex didn't really have a clear um, answer to this question, nor did I think other developers. There were some suggestions of pr some time before the launch of DevNet 5 um, and some discussions on perhaps in a few weeks or months time, I think if I recall correctly. But the decision to delay the delay, you know, any decision on EIP 7688, I think is, a, is an important one to highlight because it shows that on these calls, the, dis, the agreement from client teams to include a certain change or, or do something um, to the Ethereum protocol, that's not all that's necessary to, to make a call. I think people underestimate the importance of who is chairing these calls and what they think is important. Um, and I think both Tim, who chairs the ACDE e calls, Tim Baiko, he also works at the Ethereum Foundation, he's a protocol support lead, and the person chairing the um, consensus layer calls, Alex Stokes, both of them do have a very important role on these calls. They are not the people that just kind of take a backseat and allow the conversation to, and, and passively direct the conversation. They are not the ones that summarize decisions that have already been made on the calls. They have opinions about the state of the upgrade, the state of Ethereum, and to the extent that they can encourage developers to make a decision that in their mind is the best thing for the Ethereum protocol, for the health of the Ethereum, um, ecosystem, they will. And insofar as there isn't, you know, major disagreement with their, with their style of leadership, I think that it is kind of the end say for some of these discussions. Um, even if there is a clear support to say, in this case, include an EIP into the upgrade, it won't happen unless the chair of the calls agrees with that decision. Um, and the chair of the calls is really not the person that is simply there to, you know, uh, passively move on the, the conversation from agenda item to agenda item. Um, I think it's important to understand that these people take a very active role in the conversations and um, play, ha have a very important part to play in how some of these governance decisions ma get made and which ones are delayed for a further time. Um, of course, this these the position of being, you know, a chair of a of a of the Ethereum core developer calls is a, is one that is filled with a lot of pressure uh, because you have, of, of course, people like me that have that are reviewing these calls and listening in on them every single week. Um, but these are really where the decisions for um, Ethereum, which is the second most valuable, you know, cryptocurrency in the world, it's. A, technology that hosts so much value. Um, it's a lot of pressure um, because of all of this to be a chair on those calls. You never, I'm sure, you know, that Alex and Tim, they never want to be the responsible for having stood by when bad decisions were being made on the call, um, which of course is a subjective idea because I'm sure to some, you know, bad and good in terms of what's best for the Ethereum for the Ethereum protocol is is clearly up in the air. It's clearly a very divisive issue as some developers are very um, 
very supportive of the roll-up centric roadmap. Others are not as much. Um, we've talked about the identity crisis, so to speak, that Ethereum is going through right now. But the importance of who is chairing these calls, um, it's a lot of pressure um, on this person. And I maintain, as I've been thinking about this a little bit more, that one of the potentially one of the improvements to these calls that could be made is having the chair of the calls continue to be rotating every single week. Um, for example, instead of having one person from one organization chairing the all core developers calls indefinitely until they kind of you know, decide to move on um, to a different role, which is what happened with the former chair of the of the Alcor developers calls, Hudson Jameson, who now works at Polygon. Um, one of the things that could happen is that developers could take turns chairing those calls and offer, I guess, a, a diversification of power that is that is held in that seat. It's a idea that I've been thinking about in my head for quite a bit in terms of, of improving the decentralization and the, and the uh, style of these calls so that the pressure and also the power of making calls on these, on these, on these meetings, in these meetings, does not rest so heavily on just one person. Um, it's not just, you know, EIP, this decision to delay EIP 7688 uh, further, that is an example of when client teams are very positive, they're very enthusiastic about including uh, different code changes into the upgrade. Um, I think we've seen this, this we've also seen the, the type of leadership where um, client teams are very excited about including a different, a lot of different code changes into the upgrade, and the chair of the call, um, mostly I, I would say on perhaps the execution layer calls, um, recognize that this is something that most uh, client teams are are very happy about, um, and do decide to move forward with including it into Pectra. Now that has definitely happened before um, because client teams have voiced their support for it. But as in this case, that's not always what happens. Um, and it is up to the discretion of the chair to determine is this, and ultimately up to them, if it's a, really a wise decision to go with what the client teams are asking for and go with what the client teams are supporting. And it's also important to know which client teams are not in support. For example, in the EOF de debate, the Geth client team was very much not in favor of including EOF into the Pectra upgrade, but the rest of the client teams were. In the, this put the chair of the meetings, Tim Baiko, in a very difficult position because he essentially had to say, um, he essentially had to, to decide, is it important enough, is Geth's voice important enough to uh, halt a decision on the inclusion of EOF? And he did, and of course, the decision around EOF was, was delayed for quite a few calls, um, quite a few months, actually, uh, because it's a, it was a hard call, I think, for Tim to really make, to say EOF is in or out because of the fact that it wasn't a unanimous consensus from the client teams. Um, so again, that kind of judgment call is something that the chair that rests very heavily on the chair of these of these Ethereum developer calls. So that's one of the things that I wanted to talk about. I think I talked about it a little bit too much on today's show. Um, but I've been thinking about it and it's it's one of the the one of the interesting dynamics of the calls that I'm always aware of um, when in in terms of the decision making process around Ethereum protocol changes the importance of the of the chair of the calls very quickly because obviously we have look at the time has flown by <laughs> at least i hope it has been for you listening to this episode as it has been for me um talking about the call the other kind of important part of the call and very interesting part of the call that i'd like to highlight is the updates from probe lab probe lab is a blockchain analytics firm um, and they have done analytics on a variety of different blockchains, not just Ethereum, but they shared an update on the latest call um, from the analysis they'd done on Ethereum nodes. They have identified 8,335 nodes operating on Ethereum, which is a pretty interesting benchmark number for how many computers are running Ethereum software, supporting the Ethereum blockchain. 
This is in comparison to uh, another tool, another tool called Bitnodes. Bitnodes is a a public website that offers information about the distribution of Bitcoin nodes and the crawler that Bitnodes uses, um, this this website, which I'll link in the show notes. And I'll also link Pro, ProBlabs analysis in the show, no, show notes as well. Um, Bitnodes says that Bitcoin has 19,569 nodes running all across the world. Um, so in comparison, I mean, it might not be that much of a shock to people listening, but uh, in terms of node distribution, which is really, you know, the, the computers that are supporting the running of a public blockchain, verifying the rules of the protocol. Um, these, these, this is crucial technology. Bitcoin is more decentralized than Ethereum in this front. And Ethereum, the number of, of nodes operating Ethereum could definitely be improved, I suppose, in a relative sense to, to Bitcoin. But Bitcoin is, of course, older um, than Ethereum as a, as a blockchain. And you could argue that the the relative decentralization of, of Bitcoin and Ethereum is, can't be an apples to apples comparison because their use cases are, are so different. But in the sense that both of them are trying to be, you know, the most decentralized uh, public blockchain out there, I think that it's pretty interesting to know that ProBlab identified 8,335 nodes operating on Ethereum, which I'm sure is by far larger than any other blockchain outside of Bitcoin. Uh, a few other pretty interesting metrics around those nodes. Um, Forty-two percent of the nodes are running on the Lighthouse client. Um, this is the consensus layer client that um, consensus layer client that is more focused on security. Um, actually, I shouldn't say that. I think all of the, the consensus layer clients, of course, care about uh, security, but. Lighthouse is built by a company called Sigma Prime that is a blockchain security and auditing firm. <laughs> and the second most popular consensus layer client that is run on these nodes with 34% of the uh, share of nodes is Prism. And that's really interesting because for the longest time when Ethereum uh, first launched the beacon chain. Prism was, for a large uh, portion of Ethereum's history as a proof-of-stake blockchain, the number one most adopted consensus layer uh, client. So it's interesting to see that the popularity has switched from Prism to Lighthouse. And in large part, there was a lot of effort on the social layer of Ethereum to, to dissuade to sway people who are running Ethereum nodes from using Prism because they were worried that Prism is growing too large as a consensus layer client. And in the in the name of client diversity, there was um, a great uh, push on uh, in terms of, of social kind of consensus and, and um, you know, on Twitter and, and sentiment and the Ethereum community to switch away from Prism. And now, based on the data, it looks as though Lighthouse is growing um, in terms of its share. And I'm sure once Lighthouse maybe hits the 50 or 60 percent mark, uh, there will be another kind of backlash. There will be another, you know, push from the social layer of Ethereum to try and get node, node operators um, to try and move them away from using Lighthouse to diversify into other clients. So anyways, that was a little bit of a, a interesting note that the dominance of client diversity has shifted away from Prism. And now it looks as though 42% of Ethereum nodes are running the Lighthouse client. Another one that is a little bit less technical and, and uh, very interesting in terms of, of understanding the geographical distribution of Ethereum nodes is that 36% of Ethereum nodes are operated by users in the US. So when it comes to how important US laws and regulation is to the Ethereum blockchain, it is one of the most important countries because most of the individuals, the highest percentage of, of uh, nodes, um, 36%, these these users are all based out of the U.S. U.S. laws and regulations apply to these these individuals um, or, say, businesses and entities. The second, um, the country with the second highest share of Ethereum nodes was Germany. Um, Germany had about 17% of nodes, or is hosting about 17% of nodes. Um, of course, I think these numbers can be improved in that, you know, the more 
geographically distributed Ethereum nodes are, the more resilient Ethereum as a blockchain is and as a technology it is um, to, to regulatory capture. Um, it's clear that there is a, a leaning, a heavy leaning into, into the U.S. Um, and finally, another kind of interesting data point is that Contrary to what people expected, about half of these nodes are run not in a data center, not um, via the cloud, the AWS cloud. That's kind of a criticism of proof of stake software and proof of stake um, consensus protocols that I remember hearing about a lot when Ethereum was transitioning from proof of stake, from proof of work to proof of stake, that um, essentially all of the nodes of Ethereum are going to move to uh, a data center, that the big tech companies of the world are going to host all of the software for Ethereum, and nobody is going to run Ethereum nodes anymore. Um, it was a big, it was a kind of a big concern, but it, the data from Probe Labs showed that about half of the nodes that are operating on Ethereum are not hosted through a data center. It was curious to note one of the, the things that um, the Prism developer POTUS pointed out was that for all of the other clients outside of Lighthouse, the number of nodes that are hosted in a non-data center is higher than the number of nodes hosted in a data center. But for the Lighthouse client specifically, nodes that are running the Lighthouse client, these nodes, there's a higher number of nodes of Lighthouse nodes that are run um, via a data center than, than through a non-data center. Um, and then one of the hypotheses around why that was, um, that was shared by Alex, was that um, predominant, perhaps predom the predominant users of these lighthouse of the lighthouse client are institutions and professional node operators that um, have the resources and um, are able to diversify, or I guess have larger operations, host larger operations on, on. Um, in large data centers, as opposed to say like a home staker or a solo staker, um, that's really just running one validator, let's say, um, rather than like thousands or tens of thousands. Um, so very interesting data, I think, on um, the the type, the type of nodes, what kind of software they're running. Uh, there was also data shared on the version of software that these nodes are running. And this is very helpful in advance of an Ethereum upgrade because you can track, have Ethereum nodes, these 8,335 nodes, have they upgraded to the latest software in order to, to support the next Ethereum upgrade? So I'm sure that this kind of analysis will have um, important implications for tracking uh, the support and the readiness of node operators for Ethereum upgrades in the future. And I think it also just shows like how important um, another angle through which to measure the decentralization of Ethereum. Um, we can see that there is a heavy bias towards um, the U.S. There is a growing reliance on the, on the Lighthouse client team. Um, and surprisingly, uh, at the very least, you know, the use of data centers, which is maybe perhaps another proxy for the number of large institutions and professional node, node operators that are operating on Ethereum, that um, is about, you know, 50-50. So perhaps not as large of a concern as, as people had once thought. Um, reliance on, on also big tech companies for, for running Ethereum software, I should say. Some pretty interesting numbers um, gives you some food for thought for really putting some concrete um, to be able to concretely visualize the decentralization of Ethereum nodes, uh, the computers that support and connect allow users to connect to the Ethereum blockchain. It is something that I hope Pro Labs um, will continue to uh, monitor and track diligently. I'd love to see some of that data be. Uh, open source, um, available for researchers like me to be able to download and and create my own charts and analysis off of. Um, I hope one day, you know, maybe I'll have the Probe Labs people um, on here to talk about the research themselves. Um, but yeah, I think those were probably the most uh, interesting parts of the call that I wanted to share, the analysis from Probe Labs and the decision around delaying um, any decision on the inclusion of EIP 7688 into Pectra. I hope that you enjoyed listening to today's episode of The Infinite Jungle. I hope that you learned something new about Ethereum, as I hope every week for my listeners. Um, there will be an episode tomorrow, you can expect, uh, with some special guests. Um, as per usual, we'll have a guest episode on Wednesday. And I will talk to you guys again 
tomorrow um, with a new episode of Infinite Jungle that's going out. Um, I am signing off from the concrete jungle that is New York City in your explorations of the infinite jungle that is Ethereum. Stay safe out there.